u ime društvenog centra Oktober, u ime organizatora ove diskusije, a to je Centar za politike emancipacije, uz podršku Transform Europe, a odio se u okviru programa Studija socijalizma. Pošto imamo gosta iz Austrije koji ne govori naš jazik, odnosno razume ga, ali ne može baš da govori, prebacit ćemo se na engleski jazik, dakle sve će da svi ćemo govoriti na engleskom, tako da je to samo da... Nadam se da je to svima ok, u principu stavili smo napomenu ovi na eventu. Ok, so... Ajde skupiti. Ok, so the discussion is on the rise of the radical right in Europe, because we've seen, like, in recent elections in uh, Sweden and Germany, that uh, the radical right is in the rising, so uh, we've also had, had, like, economic crisis and the response to it, which was austerity measures, which... Uh, we can debate on whether this is actually the reason for the rise of the right wing, or maybe it's just a kind of continuity of some tendency that was older than that. So, uh, we welcome uh, Professor Joachim Becker from uh, Institute for International Economics and Development in Vienna. I hope that that's the name of the institute, okay. And Jovo Bakić, our professor uh, of sociology at the Faculty of uh, Philosophy in Belgrade. And um, so I will ask like maybe three questions to uh, our guests and then we will open up the discussion for everyone to um, ask or comment on anything. And we had an agreement that uh, while in this uh, uh, First part, uh, if you uh, maybe uh, didn't understand something correctly or some, have some question regarding what they are speaking about at the moment, you can also ask immediately and not wait until the end of the like this first part of the discussion because maybe it will be like, yeah, maybe I forgot to tell you if you, because you will be talking about political parties, and if you are um, using acronyms, maybe you should just explain what they are. Maybe not everyone is yes, yeah. familiar with all these. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, it's many parts. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so maybe the first question would be, um, if you could tell us uh, something about uh, recent historical tendency of right of rise of the right wing in Europe, what do you see as main causes for this? So maybe we can start with Joachim in this first round. Uh, you take the mic. Dobry večer. I'm sorry that I will not be able to speak in your language, but uh, I can understand to some ex to some extent. <coughs> And I think in Serbia, as in some other countries as well, at times it is claimed that the so-called migrant crisis is the root cause of the rise of the nationalist right. And I would say this is a, even a mistaken view, not only a distorted one, but even a mistaken one. Because the rise of the nationalist right in many countries already started considerably before that, for example, the today's electoral result of Freiheitliche Partei Ost, uh, of Austria, uh, uh, Freedom Party of, of Austria, is more or less the same as in 1999. Yeah, so that's not so much of a difference. And I would argue that the right that already in many cases pre-existed, uh, even the 1980s, it has transformed uh, the other parties as well, and that the rise to some extent has to do with the rise of neoliberalism, of the neoliberal state, and the neoliberal integration project. In a certain way, <coughs> the European Union from the 1980s onwards 
had followed a very clearly and increasingly neoliberal way of norm making and of its own institutional transformation. And if it is said that neoliberalism claimed that there is no alternative, I would say that the question of no alternatives in a certain way is institutionalized and inscribed into the state structures. And that is, this is very visible in the case of the EU because you have the single market and the norms of the single market are in a certain way supreme legal norms. You have certain budgetary rules, etc., that limit quite, quite considerably the space for maneuver of national governments and of all parliamentary institutions. And you have the European Central Bank as a well insulated, institu political insulated institution. So the key decision making bodies and key rules are being well insulated from popular pressures. And national parliaments played a role in that, no doubt about that. And so you have a certain way of a neoliberal, very technocratic state. The modes of accumulation that have been facilitated by these norms led to an increasing fragmentation of the labor force the core labor force has become much smaller, the precarious labor force much, much larger, and especially lowly qualified workers with very limited options. And that not only in the periphery, but also in the core. Secondly, this mode of integration of both the single market and even more of the currency union increased regional disparities. So we have an industrial core on the one hand, then around Germany, then an industrialized periphery, Central Eastern Europe, and then a deindustrialized periphery in the south and southeast of, uh, of Europe, both inside the EU and, and outside. And more generally, the within the national economies and within the nation states, the differences between core and periphery increased as well. And the welfare state has been very considerably put under pressure by the neoliberal norm making, in particular, the budgetary rules. So <coughs> the EU already had something like legitimacy, crisis of legitimacy on the input side because the lack of democracy and the crisis became obvious. I mean that uh, these policies were not really very able to deal with the crisis. And in, particularly in Southern Europe, they even increased uh, deindustrialization, poverty without resolving the so-called debt issues. So, delegitimization on the output side as well. So this facilitated to present the nation as an alternative to, to integration. On the one hand, on the second hand, I would argue that for the neoliberal nationalist right that is arguing for an exclusive welfare state, they, in a certain way, naturalize that there is a limit to the welfare state. So they are saying that if this limit, so let's cut where it is easiest. And that is, first of all, migrants, because they are not national citizens. That is especially Northwestern Europe. Then you have cases like Hungary or Central East European countries, where it is a Roma, and it might be the poorest parts of the population in general. For example, in Hungary, the homeless are, are criminalized. So the gap between the so-called decent citizens and the non-decent citizens is, in, is increased. Mm -hmm. Secondly, in parts of the periphery, the nationalist right, but rather the national conservative variety of it, 
is partially challenging this neoliberal way of economic policy making. In particular, as in the case of Italy, the currency union. And arguing that domestic capital is to be strengthened. Mm -hmm. Then I see a, a different vector that has not so much to do with the question of class, but rather with the question of gender. The gender roles have ch changed, policies have changed as well, and there is a back, certain backlash to that, and practically all uh, nationalist parties have an extremely reactionary point of view on uh, gender relations and want to re-relegate women as something like a buffer labor force. And uh, with that, uh, they attract certain, especially certain types of workers for their position, but also parts, uh, parts of the middle class. Secondly, one has to see that the precarization by the demo demolition of the welfare state has increased, in, at least in certain regions, the dependency on the family for survival and for subsistence. And I think that this plays a role as well, particularly in the more peripheral areas, for such a backlash to find a certain resonance. Mm -hmm. And it is quite obvious that, uh, I mean, it, it is not just one factor that can ex explain the rise of the nationalist right. And uh, there is a tendency of externalizing the reasons for problems and the main culprit for that usually it is, it is migrants or existing or long existing minorities in the existing societies, whereas the nationalist right does not question or discuss the role of capital, for example, in existing problems and crises. So that would be my introductory statement. I would argue that one could recognize both structural and cultural causes of the rise of the radical right in Europe, since especially 1990s, but one can look even before that, and if one wants to recognize starting points Nouvelle droit, new right, French new right, is uh, unescapable to look for the ideological shift in uh, uh, Western Europe. Firstly, Anel, uh, Alain de Benoit recognized that one should use thought of Marxist Antonio Gramsci in order to win hegemony, cultural hegemony. And it was standpoint of uh, Metapolitics. Alain de Benoit talked about, wrote about metapolitics. One should win cultural battle, and afterwards, political forces could use it. And they realized that old fashioned fascism isn't strong enough to win voters because it was <coughs> a largely compromised ideology from the Second World War. 
So they were groupusculous of uh, national revolutionaries, fascists, neo-Nazis, uh, Catholic solidarists, uh, who fought each other all the time. And in 1972, Jean-Marie Le Pen founded Front National. And he united all the, group, the groupusculus that I mentioned. There were several streams of the far right that he collected within the National Front. Uh, at the time, it was still very weak. Between 1972 and 1983, uh, there was no result above 1%. Only in 1983, that was, that was the first breakthrough, electional break breakthrough. And neoliberalism was the first innovation that Jean-Marie Le Pen introduced. In 1976, he changed corporatism with neoliberals. And when Ronald Reagan won in the US, uh, he said, I introduced Reaganomics several years before Ronald Reagan. And he was right. Uh, although he didn't say that General Pinochet was the first one. He introduced neoliberalism in 1973 after the murder of Salvador Allende in Chile. So, uh, with Chicago boys. And that was cultural issue. But structural issue is even more important. And Joachim told about it. I will only add uh, some additional features. For instance, I would argue that Le Grand Gloriose three glorious decades between 1945 and 1975. It was quite an normal exception in European history. Normality, European normal state is state of racism and high inequality, social inequality. The highest inequality was just before the First World War. And it was one of the causes of, of the First World War. Then two world wars produces a huge, enormous destruction of wealth. And one of the byproducts of it was high, the, the rise of equality. Another one was, be, uh, after the First World War, fear of the socialist revolution. If, if you, for instance, for, for citizens of this country, it is highly recommendable uh, to read historical sources, newspapers, after the First World War in the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. It is full of fear of socialist revolution. And uh, bourgeois politicians argued uh, for introduction of social policy 
in order to avoid socialist revolution. First, social uh, legal measures in, in kingdom of the uh, of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes were caused by fear of revolution. After the Second World War, it was even bigger fear of socialist revolution because Soviet Union was on the border of the Western Europe. And it was extremely important for societies. For instance, France, Communist Party, was together with, with the uh, Gaullists, the strongest party in France. Communist Party in Italy, only after Christian Democrats, was the strongest party. So it was extremely important to introduce welfare state. Welfare state was an instrument to fight communism. If you have welfare state, you can stop communist danger. And social democrats were very successful in it. Uh, at least for a moment, it looked like as uh, capitalism could be humanized. For the first time in history, capitalism looked as something humanized, with a human capitalism with human face. The problem was with uh, oil crisis, the beginning of the 1970s. It was the first attack on welfare state. And 1979, that was second attack. Neoliberal counter-revolution, I would say, just followed. Breakup of European socialism was the most important issue. Since 1990, capitalists are not frightened. And it is quite fine to introduce a uh, harshest neoliberalism that you can imagine in societies. There is no danger of socialist revolution anymore. And inequality, I would uh, like to, to, uh, to stress the importance of the book wrote by Thomas Piketty, Capital in 21st Century. It, it, it has been translated into, Serbs, into Serbian. Uh, <coughs> he argued and showed that uh, inequality has risen several times after 1990. And it is comparable only with the uh, pre First World War times, it is still lower than in pre-First World War times, but it is comparable. Welfare state is almost ruined, not thoroughly, certainly there are remnants of welfare state in uh, Nordic countries, in Germany, in uh, France. However, and Joachim told about it, uh, to, that, that welfare chauvinism is a new fashion. 
So firstly, at, at, at the end of the 20th century, uh, neoliberalism was new fashion for far right. Today, it is welfare chauvinism. What does it mean? It means, yes, we want welfare state, but for us, not for migrants. Who cares for migrants? <coughs> they are cheaters. They, they want to uh, misuse welfare state. There will, be, there will be no money for our pensioners, for our un unemployed, for our disabled persons. And it is the old uh, measure that, that Jean-Marie Le Pen talked about, préférence uh, nationale. Or America, America first, translated into English, into Donald Trump's language, and and that's it. So one has to uh, take into account both structural and cultural changes since 1985, and many issues would be clear. For instance, Germany is a newcomer, alternative for Deutschland, alternative for, for, for Germany. This newcomer, only two years ago, uh, it, it, it became uh, the third party in Germany. But uh, alternative for Deutschland is quite comparable to Front National in France, or to Freiheitliche uh, Partei, Freedom Party of Austria. So they, they are just sister parties. On the other hand, we, can, we, could, uh, we could also recognize some, firstly, neoliberal parties, especially in uh, Denmark, in, in uh, uh, Norway, in Switzerland, Lega Nord, or just Lega today. Uh, they were firstly neoliberal parties. And afterwards, they became uh, radicalized in, in right terms. But the result is pretty, pretty much the same. But I think it's, it's too long for the, for the first introductory note. Okay, but it, it was very interesting uh, for me when you were talking about this welfare chauvinism, that neoliberalism actually introduced something quite similar inside the nation state, like towards anyone who uses any kind of, you know, benefits. Like today in Serbia we have this, like, um, discourse of uh, pregnant women who are cheaters, you know, like they they cheat that, you know, they need more time to look after their children or whatever to get prolonged uh, whatever, like either time for the care for the baby or something like that. And they also cheat for like money that they get which is like something that they paid for through taxes. It's, it's like this whole cheaters discourse is actually quite, quite, um, it's also towards Roma people who are parasites and they use our tax money for blah, blah, blah. So it's like very widespread um, discourse. But okay, let's go back to the, this main topic, like since you are both involved with the, um, research of uh, right-wing and extreme right-wing political options in Europe. Could you explain to us in more detail um, how does this landscape look like, this landscape of these right-wing groups uh, in different European countries? I don't know which one should go first. I think that 
Yeah, you also, you Akim also likes to point out the difference between core country and peripheral countries. So yeah. First of all, I would say there are two main currents of the nationalist right. I would say the largest one is a neoliberal, actually, it is a neoliberal one. It is prevalent in the core countries, clearly prevalent in the core countries, but there are some very pronounced forms of it as well in certain parts of the periphery. And these parties actually want to deepen the dependent forms of development. For me, Obchanska Demokratitska Strana, Civic uh, Democratic uh, Party in Czech Republic, or the Slovak Sloboda uh, Solidarita, I think I don't have to translate that, are very uh, prominent examples of that. <coughs> the second current, I would uh, say it is a predominantly uh, national conservative one, which always there's at least some neoliberal elements as well. I would see Fides as a very prominent representative of that current, but even a more pronounced conservative one, I would say it's Bravo, is probably the Polish, Polish party. But you have <coughs> national conservative elements, not only in these industrial periphery parties, but you have it as well in two declining industrial countries, and that is France, Rassemblement National, former Front National, and from my point of view, as well, Lega. So there are some new liberal elements as well, but it's, it's a mixture. And I would say that there is a relatively small minority of parties that have very strong fascist elements. That is mainly in South, actually mainly in Southeastern Europe. And uh, for example, in Bulgaria, Ataka, uh, Golden, Dawn. Golden Dawn in Greece, but you have as well in Slovakia Judova Strana, Nasce Slovensko of Kotleba, mm -hmm. or Jobbik in Hungary. Mm -hmm. And I would like to characterize these, especially the main two currents. I mean, you have mentioned that Front National in the beginning had something like corporatist ideas. That is not the case anymore. And uh, actually now, regarding the state, they are, they are actually arguing for insulate, more or less for insulating the state from pressures of popular organizations, that they have a neoliberal technocratic idea of the state at times linked to forms of direct democracy Plebiscitarian democracy, but the, I would say critical point of view regarding parliamentary uh, system from my point of view, not openly anti parliamentarian, more cautious than that, but nevertheless, and a clearly anti trade union position. And that is quite, and they usually are very weak in the trade union movement. So they claim to represent the non-organized forces against the ossified organizations of Lengo. So that is mainly the discourse. That is the anti-bureaucratic uh, anti revolution in the French or Austrian way, in a certain way. And regarding economic policy, I mean, they are advocating uh, norm-based policy making, austerity as an inevitable uh, necessity, so with that they are actually with the mainstream and totally adaptable to the EU. Regarding um, social policies, at times they pretend to insinuate that they would offer us at least elements of a return to the past of the 1960s and 1970s, for example, the Scandinavian parties, the Austrian uh, Freiheitliche uh, Partei, Freedom Party, they present themselves as so-called Soziale Heimatpartei, Sozialna Domovina Stranka, and Domovina is a good translation of Heimat, it would be difficult to translate it into English actually, but 
if one looks at what they really represent, I mean, that is uh, rather parsimony in her social policies and forms of open and institutionalized segregation against specific groups, especially migrants, but as well against the poor. And that for me is an element of, that is really very neoliberal as well. And in so far, I mean, this so pretending to be social, if one looks at what they're really saying, and now in Austria implementing, that is, I mean, far from being social. This is a total, this is a total opposite. Yeah? In so far, their nationalism actually is basically focusing on an exclusivist welfare state, from my, my point of view, at least in northwestern in northwestern Europe, in, in the in the eastern part of Europe. It is a much more I would say, much more complicated issue than it is rather about hidden at times open forms of discrimination against Roma from my point of view and against again against the poor but regarding the migrants of their own country it's a different story that they are full for full rights of migrants for example Hungarian migrants in Austria or Germany no doubt about that so we have a certain let's say tension in the, in the discourse National conservatism presents itself as an alternative, and I would say to some extent it is even a reactionary alternative. Because, I mean, it is explicitly anti-technocratic. It says parliamentary elections can be a vote of the national and for the national forces. And the Polish national conservatives, which are, who I would regard as the most advanced intellectuals of national conservatism, like Krasnodevsky says, we need something like national republicanism. It does not use the word, but it is a republicanism that is linked less to the demos, but rather to the ethnos. Only in that case, the Polish nation, it says there are different forms of republicanism, and that can be national as well. And that, is his, that is his preference. So you have a certain type of delegitimization of the other political forces that are regarded as being non-national or even anti-national. No? And it is a repoliticizing of politics, not a depoliticization like in, in neoliberalism. In that regard, I would really say it is, uh, it is, it is different. And referenda can play an important role as well in order to show the national, so-called national deal. Mm -hmm. Regarding economic policies, the more advanced or serious national conservatives would say it is not such a good idea to have these fixed norms. This a certain type of flexibility is necessary, and the state has to play a certain proactive role in development. Even forms of so-called intelligent protectionism are advanced. In that regard, you have a certain form of right-wing developmentalism. And it is, so far it is not surprising that it is parties that are either in countries of severe deindustrialization like France or Italy, or where the dependent Industrialization is reaching certain limits, like for example Poland and Hungary. Mm -hmm. So that is linked to the political economy. Regarding <coughs> the welfare state, they are not for, for further privatization of social security, but rather focusing on the uh, existing social security institutions. <coughs> But their social policies are, have a clearly conservative outlook, particularly in regard to gender roles. So they tend to uh, promote so-called family policies, and family policies are about women at home and caring for the children. It may be working part-time. And so family benefits, etc., should cement or restore those roles. Regarding nationalism, it is 
forms of economic nationalism that regard really different. It is not surprising that it's rather parties in the semi-periphery or in countries which are moving from core to semi-periphery that advocate certain forms of nationalism that are to strengthen domestic capital, but as well at times to strengthen existing industrial structures yeah? and maybe enable certain inward-looking development. Depending on the question whether they are migrants or not, the question of the exclusivist welfare state plays a role, strongly in the case of Front National Rassemblement National, does exist in the case of Liga as well, and in Hungary it has rather this anti-Roma bias, the issue is not relevant in Poland. Mm -hmm. I think that in the political forms of uh, mobilization, there are certain parties that show fascist tendencies. I mean, regarding positions on the state, the fascist parties are not open about that because if they are saying that they are openly for authoritarian regime, they might be banned. So you won't find that in the program. They're not so stupid. <clears throat> but you have a certain cult of force, of violence. They might have paramilitary forces linked to them, like Ludovic Skrana, Nasze Slovensko, they had it, and partially they still have. Jobbik had it, very important for recruiting members. So you can see it in that, I would say, in forms of aggressive, racist, and at times targeted at, at particular individuals campaigning, you can see it as well. For me, Fides has these elements, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah? And you have certain elements of the traditional discourse of fascism that might be that might be that might be reactivated. So at times it is said that it is a certain type of let's say post-fascism which adapts certain elements. But in other regards it is very different because it is not about uh, re-establishing mass organizations or building mass organizations under, under the control of the party because it is a different era with different organizational forms. Mm -hmm. But there is a certain, even in parties that cannot be called now fascist, you have certain elements in Alternative for Deutschland, for example, it has around it, uh, I would say, uh, really militant right-wing forces, and for example, it is called that it is legitimate to take the, right, the law into its own hands. I mean, that is a discourse on its own, and that is moving beyond certain limits. So that would be my, uh, my panorama with a certain contextualizing in the division of labor. Uh, I would like to uh, make a difference between extreme right and radical right. Uh, both are streams of far right. And the values, core values, are pretty much the same. Nationalism, xenophobia, and authoritarianism. Whenever you can recognize the three values at the core, ideological core of, of some movement, you can certainly talk about extreme or radical right. And what is the difference between extreme and radical right? Extreme right is always violent. Extreme right is always ready to use violence in order to achieve ideological and political goals. Radical right would try to present itself as something much more sophisticated. Uh, nouvelle droit, again was the first ideological force that introduces, introduced this kind of 
or, or struggle. So instead of violence, you should agitate. You should win votes. Instead of fighting with leftists, you should fight Marxism at the universities. Instead of racism, you should use ethno-pluralism. And what does it mean, ethno-pluralism? No, I'm not a racist. I just think that any mixture of different religions, different ethnic groups and races, but it's not my primary focus, is something damaging to society. And that is why Islam is not accepted as a European religion. Islam is absolutely anti-European religion. They have to be Christian Europe. And when we talk about Christian Europe, we cannot be accused as racist. Otherwise, we are racist if we say, look at that nigger. No, we could say, you know, Muslim is not able to accommodate to our culture. And that's the problem. So we are not racists. We are not racists. We are just ethno-pluralists. And Islamophobia today is functional substitute for anti-Semitism before. So today, for instance, Dutch radical rightist Heart Wilders. He says, I'm not anti Semitic. I'm not. I visited Israel I don't know how many times. And I think that he said that he visited Israel 30 and something times. So obviously I'm not anti Semit. Avigdor Lieberman. Israel politician always minister in some of Netanyahu's governments is my friend and of course they are friends because Lieberman is extreme rightist so it is kind let's introduce ethnocracy everywhere so when Herbert Wilders came to Netherlands, he said to, to the public, no, I'm not far rightist. I'm, I cannot cooperate with Jean-Marie Le Pen, because he is anti-Semite and I'm not. Only when Marine Le Pen expelled his, her own father from National Front, Herbert Wilders said, yes. That's it. Because anti-Semites were expelled from National Front, we can cooperate because our enemies are not Jews, but Muslims. And we can cooperate with Israel. And certainly we can use Russian money to, uh, to, to have money. Because capital uh, is not delighted Today, today, as it was before, all known German industrial names like Krupp, like Hugo Boss, like uh, Porsche, they helped Hitler before the Second World War and during the war, Siemens. But uh, Jean Renault, 
his company was nationalized after the 1945 because he was collaborator. Uh, today, big capital looks for uh, neoliberal solutions. And that is why radical right lacks lacks money. But Russia is here. And Putin has, of course, his own interests to, to push in this, this direction. And what are the streams? Let's see from party to party. Norway, progressive party, neoliberal. Danish, people's party. Firstly, neoliberal, today, welfare chauvinist. Uh, Liga, in Italy, firstly, neoliberal. Today, uh, Matteo Salvini says, well, fascism was, in many respects, pretty good. He's not the only one who says things like that. Silvio Berlusconi told several times such things. It is like any Serbs would say, yes, Dmitry Aljotic was really fine guy. And uh, in Austria, it is an interesting case. Uh, it is a combination of German nationalism and liberalism from the very beginning. And many Nazi collaborators were founders of Freiheitliche Partei Österreichs. Uh, then Germany, Alternative for Deutschland. Two streams were at the very beginning, in 2013. One neoliberal, led by Bernd Lucke, uh, Hamburg professor of economy, neoliberal. Another one, Neue Rechte, New Right, German New Right, strongly under influence of uh, France, French, Nouvelle Droit. And for instance, Stein, I forgot his uh, first name, uh, uh, editor of, of uh, uh, Junge. Freiheit. Junge Freiheit. That's a right wing weekly. Yes. The most known one far right. Of weekly. course. And, and, and it is uh, one of the main vehicles for Neue Rechte ideas. And Stein said at the very beginning, Bernd Lucke is a new hope for conservatives. Not you, do, do not use words such as uh, fascism, such a uh, uh, radical right or populist or right populist. No, 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 no. And for instance, uh, Jean Marie Le Pen uh, talked about um, ni gauche ni droit francaise, neither left nor right French. So it, it means that uh, so, so it is called so called ninism. Ninis. Uh, it, and German new, new right learned the lesson. And it, is, it was especially difficult for German new right because of the Second World War. And that is why Alternative für Deutschland is so, uh, so newcomer. It was much more difficult for such a party than for any other party in the rest of the Europe. Uh, in Sweden, uh, Swedish Democrats, they, they were a coalition of neo-Nazi, neo-fascist groups. Uh, and today's research from, from our colleagues from Sweden show that uh, most of uh, the, the deputies that, that were elected in, uh, in the Swedish parliament, Swedish parliament are people uh, who were not involved in politics at all uh, 
for decades. So this is first time for them. And if I may, I would make a connection with the left at very this, at this very point. You have to do such issue. You have to look for people who were not involved in politics if you want to build strong left. But it is just a short excursion. And then, uh, <coughs> Netherlands, being full time, and neither Dutch case is extremely interesting because it shows flexibility, ideological flexibility of the far right. Pim Fortein was the first far rightist uh, who was successful. Only in 2002, before that, Dutch culture is quite similar to German culture. So uh, whenever far rightists tried to organize themselves, leftists came and beat them very harsh. So leftists were much stronger in the Dutch political culture than rightists. And any, any guy who would say, yes, Hitler was good, he would be in, in, in danger for his life. But then Pim Fortein, ex-Maoist from the left stream of the Socialist Party of Netherlands and manifest gay. When one imam in Netherlands said that gays are like cattle, he stood for right of imam to speak openly what he has to talk about. And he added, yeah, he should say what he thinks. But I would argue that Islam is some kind of retarded religion. So I would defend his right to say what he thinks, and which is, by the way, forbidden by Dutch constitution. And let me argue what I have to say regarding our political correctness and the terror of political correctness in, in the Dutch culture. He was killed and afterwards Herbert Wilders appeared. Herbert Wilders, who would always argue, you know, I am for gender equality, for sure. And you know, Muslims are not. That's the problem why they are not accommodated to European culture. And that is why I'm a proper European, because I'm fighting for gender equality. And his Freedom Party is probably the only one in Europe that has equal number of males and females as voters. In all other European far-right parties, you will find gender gap. Four or five times more male vote for radical party radical right party, and especially educated women, almost none of them. Of course, there are exceptions. For, for example, in Alternative für Deutschland, Alice Weidel, Weidel. Uh, she is openly <coughs> lesbian. And, and that's, that's the point. So we are open. We accept all people. We are not at all far-rightist. Not at all. 
You are not, not right when you accuse me as a ferret. Although, of course, when you see uh, a program moved to Warheit, uh, it was the, the first slogan, uh, courage, for, uh, courage for the Truth, and that, the second slogan was uh, moved to uh, Germany, courage for Deutschland, Germany, and uh, the third one was, hmm, I cannot recall exactly, but it is uh, something like Germany be brave. So it is combination and uh, youth for Alternative für Deutschland is even more right wing oriented than uh, core of the party. Uh, Björn Höcke is idol of the youth of Alternative für Deutschland. And Björn Höcke talks about thousand year Reich and it is a typical, typical phrase from the Third Reich period. Uh, he, he told that uh, Holocaust is uh, nothing really special. One should uh, forget it. Not to talk too much about it. Not to talk about it, yeah. So, uh, Alexander Gauland, probably the, the most powerful guy in, in the party, he was Christian Democrat. I am. I am. <laughs> but then uh, he started to collaborate with uh, uh, Neuert. And today he is the uh, uh, most powerful guy in Alternative für Deutschland. Uh, Pegida, organization you know for, for that. Patriotische uh, Euro. Patrioten. Patriotski građani Evrope protiv Islam. Every Monday they marched against Islam and immigrants. Every Monday. And uh, Gerd Skubicek, uh, another leader from Noe Rechte, uh, was probably the most important speaker at their meetings. Firstly, Alternative für Deutschland was not so right-oriented that, that he wanted. But today, he is happy to be in favor of Alternative für Deutschland. Because some neoliberal, neoliberals uh, were expelled, with Ben Luke and, and others. And today, Alternative für Deutschland is really far-right party, proper far-right party. And Golden Dawn in Greece, open neo-Nazis, open neo-Nazis. Michalolakis was a supporter of a military fascist dictatorship. Uh, at the beginning of the 1970s, as a young guy. Today, he's the leader of Golden Dawn. Uh, even today, they are not ashamed to uh, have flags with uh, some kind, some modification of swastika. And Joachim mentioned Jobbik. It is quite a fascist. Uh, very dangerous uh, organization. Viktor Orban is something similar. But even in Austria, Sebastian Kurz, uh, he in many ways accepted far-right uh, ideology. Not completely. Mark Rutte, in Netherlands, in many ways, accepted values of the far right. And that is why 
Hans Christian Strache and uh, Herbert Wilders were not able to, uh, to, to make a success. However, Strache said after the last elections, you know, our values win. And I think he's right. I think that that's, that's something that, that's happening all around Europe, unfortunately. Okay, so now we have some polls that say that in next European elections that are supposed to be held in May 2019, <coughs> that uh, right will take much more seats than it held up to now. Also, it's, I mean, I know that Europe is a topic, but it's also quite interesting to look at what's happening in the United States since they also have midterm elections now in a few weeks. And up until now, the predictions were that the uh, Republican Party will lose many seats. Uh, but then after this case of uh, Judge Brett Ka Kavanaugh, who was accused of uh, sexual assault against his uh, high school colleague, I think, after that, they regained all these votes. So Trump actually never, since he was elected, had this much support. He was somewhere around 30%, 35%, and now he's like 45% after that case. So that's quite interesting regarding this importance of this cultural conflict. But also let's, yeah, like, we'll go back to Europe. So you can Tell me, like, how do you see tendencies of uh, uh, right-wing political parties and movement developing in the future? And also, how, what do you think that the left-wing strategies of political organizing should be in dealing with this, uh, with this situation regarding the right-wing, but also in wider socio-economic context. So yeah, whoever wants to go first. <coughs> I mean, the, I would say the mainstream liberals try to present a divide between decent, I would say decent neoliberals on the one hand and undecent populists. And at times it is even said that the populists say that it is uh, them, the people, against the so-called elite. But if one has a look at the programs, you will not find it. You will not find it in any program. And <clears throat> what you will be finding is nationalism, but not this divide. Actually, the divide between the rule, rule, uh, ruling class and the other classes, it is not part of the program not even in terms of elite and masses. If they are criticizing so-called elites, it is a specific elite, the liberal elite, yeah? but not elite as such. Often they regard themselves as an alternative elite, from my point of view. Alternative for Deutschland. Yeah? Alternative for Deutschland, what it is representing alternative elite for Germany. That's, that's, that's. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah? One thing that's quite interesting to me as a topic, you because you mentioned it a, a bit, is for both of you, is like, um, I think that you're both uh, quite critical of the term populism. So that would be interesting to maybe um, say a bit more about, because this is quite... Uh, yeah. So, I mean, if you have a look at that, you may not find it. When the parties of the nationalist right are speaking about the people, das Volk, they are speaking about the nation. In many Slavic languages, we have the difference between Lut or Lit on the one hand and Narod on the other hand. So they are talking about Narod to be quite, quite clear. So, I mean, that is a quite clearly ethnically, culturally defined term. And so it is the nation against the others. And that is a horizontal, not a vertical conflict. Uh, so, the vertical conflict is de facto dismissed from the political landscape 
or mental map of these right-wing parties. That is very important to understand. At times they have this appeal to the common man, and that's really man, mush, <laughs> yeah, to be clear about that. It's not about women, usually. And so they might have an appeal to the popular classes a bit as well, yeah, but that is not, not, not particularly strong. Secondly, at times it is said, yes, populism, I mean, that they're pro programmatically thin, but that is stupid. <laughs> because, I mean, they have an elaborate, often they have elaborate programs, not all of them. I mean, Partei for the Freiheit of Herr Wilder, it is one page. Yeah? So one page and half a page of that is uh, about the Islamic danger and the de-Islamization of humor. But that is, a, that is the exception. And so there is an, I mean, there is a socio-economic program, and I think it is a necessity to discuss those programs. To reveal, I mean, that it is, that is part of it, that in many cases it is a neoliberal program, with a clear interest behind it. Yeah? And uh, I think that one of the, I would say, mistakes, as well of the left, is to totally focus only on one issue. And that is actually the issue, at least in Western Europe, those parties want to discuss, and that is migration. Mm -hmm. And all other issues are hardly discussed. And that is, I would say, wrong, because they have much more on, off on offer, and these offers need to be discussed. So when they are saying we are more broadly based, one should take that seriously, mm -hmm. and uh, the Belgian trade unions have a very nice produced a very nice brochure. It is called Looking Differently at New Flemish Alliance. And they did it. Then they looked what they are proposing, or what they proposed in social economic terms. And that was extremely neoliberal and anti-workers. Yeah? I think that is very important, actually, to do that. I mean, there are some, there's one party that, to some extent, is an exception that is Bravo is probably washed, because it's Indeed, it is more social than its competitors. And it has more or less almost a monopoly on the social questions and issues in Poland. Now, the only other party that is Razem that is talking about that, uh, but the social, so called social democrats, I mean, they were a total failure in that regard. And if, I mean, if right wing party is able to gain a monopoly on the question of, of social policy, then I would say the total disaster is of good. And <clears throat> so far, I would say the party that are at least a partial alternative to neoliberalism, I would say, are more difficult to deal with in a certain way. Mm? Because they are something different from the neoliberals, but in right wing terms. And therefore, all alternatives, I would say, have to break seriously with neoliberal neoliberalism to start this. And so far, this divide between neoliberals versus populists, that has to be rejected. There needs to be something like a third pole. A left-wing pole that is presenting alternatives. And alternatives that start in the existing, not only have a very far-fetched uh, future vision. So far, I would say one of the main challenges is not only to criticize the nationalist right, but to present an alternative. An alternative that is not an alternative for, Deu alternative for, jo alternative for, for Deutschland or an alternative for Serbia, uh, but that is a socio-economic alternative. Yeah? So that would be my main message. I, I strongly agree with you, so, uh, and I would illustrate with the example of the Italian League. Uh, they fought an election campaign for ordinary Italian. As much as they fought a couple decades ago to Padanians, Lombards, and against Italian nationalism, and especially against Southern Italians, uh, they, they talked that Africa begins in Rome. 
There is infamous statement by uh, former leader Umberto Bossi. Uh, what is real politics that economic policy that Liga introduced? Flat tax rate. So it's not a progressive tax rate, but flat tax rate. Everyone, it doesn't matter how much he or she earns, would pay the same amount of money to, to the state. And of course, it is in favor of rich people, in favor of capitalists. But uh, his mouth, Matteo Salvini's mouth, would, was full of worry to ordinary Italian. And whenever you have uh, far rightists in, in a position of power, usually he, not she, would introduce extremely right economic policy. And for instance, all of you knows, know that uh, Hitler's party was a nationalist, socialist, workers' party of Germany. So are we stupid enough to believe that the name is an essence of, of the path. Are we stupid enough to believe that Freiheitliche Partei, Freedom Party, Austria is really Freedom Party, or the same is the case with the uh, uh, Party of Netherlands? Uh, or Liberal Democratic Party of Russia? led by Zhirinovsky. Are we stupid enough to believe in the name of the party? No, we have to carefully, carefully investigate what is the program and what is a practical policy when they are in office. For instance, Danish People's Party they rejected to be uh, part of any government. But almost every single government since 2000 was dependent on Danish People's Party. And that is why anti-immigrant law in Denmark is the most strict law to immigrants probably in Europe. And it is model law for any any other far right path in Europe. Uh, and Joachim uh, talked about uh, migration as not really a case in terms of social sciences. No, it, 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 it's not a case, because Sweden, every fourth citizen of Sweden wasn't born in Sweden. Still, only in 2012, I think, that was election breakthrough of Sweden, Swedish Democrats. So it, it wasn't really the case. But the, the issue is that far-right parties are able enough to use refugee crisis in order to win votes. And it was pretty much the same when Nationalist Socialist Party of Germany used so-called danger of communism to win votes. If you're able to really 
frighten people. And if you say that you have medicine strong enough to fight the illness, to fight the fear, you could win votes. And there, uh, unfortunately, they, they, they were very skillful to win votes because of fear that they are also very skillful to produce. Uh, just imagine, again, Italian lead. They uh, brought pigs at any Italian city that wanted to build a mosque. And then they uh, cut pigs and uh, threw the blood to the soil because they knew that Muslims afterwards will not build the mosque. It is Europe in 2018. So, so-called European values, I really hate them. I really hate them. European values are full of racism, are full of hatred. And we have to uh, return to some values of enlightenment. And by the way, I have to, to say it. Uh, Joachim is not familiar with, with it, so excuse me, but, but I will try to explain. Uh, have you noticed a couple of days ago uh, national avant-garde, national avant-garde, and uh, whole st state leadership was there. President, Prime Minister, Minister of Interior. National avant-garde was founded last year. It was a phantom organization founded by the state. What is the program of National Manamanda? Archaeofuturism. Archaeofuturism. Who invented such issue? Guillaume Fai. And who is Guillaume Fai? Guillaume Fai is one of the founders of Nouvelle Droit, the second guy after Alain de Benoit. What is archaeofuturism? Because National Avantgarde hasn't explained it. She, it just mentioned archaeofuturism. We believe in archaeofuturism and we would like to found our state in, on the basis of archaeofuturism. <laughs> what is it? Guillaume Fay wrote a book with the very same title, Archive Futures. And you can download it at nice pirate Lincoln site. So, Russian, thank you very much. Otherwise, it wouldn't be, it, it wouldn't be possible to read it. Uh, it is a proper racist text. It is quite a reactionary text. So, archaeo, it means we should believe in some ancient values. And what are the ancient values? Certainly, females should be under males. Certainly, uh, warrior caste should uh, lead the country. And really, what we are fighting against is egalitarianism. Guillaume Fay ex explicitly wrote, we should fight egalitarianism and enlightenment values, all modern values, so we are really devoted to some uh, 
ancient values that we would like to introduce to our future, and that is archaeofuturism, because the present situation is catastrophic. And it is catastrophic because it is egalitarian, although, of course, pseudo-egalitarian. But still, ideolog ideology is egalitarian. So we have to fight it. And that is archaeofuturism. And this very state found the organization. What does it mean? It is a signal of Alexander Vucic to Heinz Christian Strache, to uh, other far rightists in Europe. Yes, one day I could be a far rightist again if this is a trend. So uh, the, the very same manner that I changed my ideology 10 years ago will be possible again in five or ten years, or doesn't matter, I will do it again. And that's it. One should be aware of it. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we can uh, open up the public discussion now. <laughs> I see one hand already. Yeah. 